Hello everybody, how are we doing? Welcome. I hope we're all I hope we're all doing alright today. Having a nice day in the sun. Um I went for a walk, it was very lovely. So um yeah, so this is uh the third of my transport tavern shows. I hope you're looking forward to something about directors. It's not as Dry. I'm trying to make it not as dry as uh, you might think. Um, it's a very interesting subject. So, uh, yeah. Um, so on with the show, shall we say. So let's have a look. So uh, what am I drinking? Today? I'm not drinking a beer today. I'm drinking tea. Uh, Redbush, Earl Grey Redbush by Dragonfly. Very good. Very nice. Uh, very nice brew. So, well, there's five people in the room, so I might as well start. Um, so what, we, what we're going to talk today about, what we're going to go through, is uh, looking at sort of who, who the railway directors were, what their activities were, and, you know, we're going to try and unpack what is the role of director in British railway history before 1939. And I think it's kind of important. It's kind of interesting because we get a lot of talk about managers, the general manager, of course, locomotive superintendents. But those people in in formal terms answered to the directors. They uh, were directed by the directors. Huh, good. I like that. And they were they were shaped. The decisions were shaped by the directors. So we're going to talk about um, how how the directors fitted into policy, but also who they were, what their backgrounds were, and, you know, did they control policy? So fundamentally, uh, directors are the representatives of the shareholders. Most railway companies required a director to have a certain amount of shares. And this varied between company to company, but the director was there to, to fundamentally uh, keep, keep secure the uh, the money uh, the, the the investment of the shareholders, but of course they were large shareholders and investors themselves. So we've got on the screen we've got two individuals here: uh, George Carr Glenn, who was a as a banker, he was a prolific banker and he had investments in many railway companies. So he he was an important individual because he had lots of money in various places, and he would invest. Uh, invest in sort of railways and he would get in, in the, on the board and also his bank um, Glynn's bank was a, a a place where the railways uh, deposited a lot of their money so he was kind of critical to a lot of railway sort of financial processes so he naturally wanted uh, we'll, we'll talk about what are called interlocking directorships a bit later that's when you have I'm a, I'm a railway director but I always also sit on the board of another company but I, I think more interesting is, is kind of, you know, the for me personally, are the links towards merchants. A lot of railway directorships were, a lot of the early railway directors were merchants. Um, and they, the merchants class were particularly interested in better transport. They were people who wanted better transport and so they invested in the railways. So I should say, if anybody's got any questions, I take it you can hear me. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, just let me know. So merchants were a, a big part. And, and this, this fellow, John Moss of Ottersport, was actually quite important in getting the Liverpool to Manchester line. Now, one of the things I think we need to talk about more in academia is actually the role of slavery in the early investment and the early uh, development of the railway industry because not only was slavery fundamental to some of the you know the wealth of many of the early directors so john moss was a, a, a major slaveholder um he he invested a lot of that money in the liverpool manchester railway who you know very wealthy he owned plantations but also a lot of the traffic and trade say if we take um the liverpool to manchester where they're you know taking cotton across the railway network Cotton, of course, came from the plantations in the south 
the United States. Other other products, goods uh, like sugar, came from plantations. So there's a there's a, a, a quite important link between slavery uh, and the early railways in in Britain. I think, of course, you know other 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 cities would have that link as well. Bristol, for example, was built a lot on you know the, the wealth of Bristol was built built on slavery and a lot of the directors come out on sort of merchant groups within Bristol and their money comes from slavery but that's not the entire picture in say the Stockton Darlington the directors you had a very large um, Quaker element and many Quakers were campaigners against slavery um, especially like the Pises who are you know, northeastern directors of Stockton Darlington, they were campaigners against slavery. So you've got an interesting story to be told. But generally, we can identify five different types of directors on the on the railways: merchants, bankers, industrialists, aristocrats, and landed individuals, and ex railway officers. So merchants, we talked a bit about merchants, bankers. Not in great numbers towards the end of the period. Industrialists surprisingly don't really turn up on the boards of, of a great many railway companies. Um, the exception to that, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, is the Northeastern Railway, which was formed and its directorship was essentially a representative sample of, of, of the industrial interests in the northeast of Britain. And that has certain uh, certain value that had value for for many people um uh, many of the industries because they could maybe negotiate cheaper rates they could direct investment and there are so we say network benefits there aristocrats and landed individuals well of course many aristocrats were quite resistant to the railways coming through their bit of turf and i think as time goes on they realize that this is this is a, a change of direction this is a change of who was you know who was available you know uh the, the railways would change everything and especially from about 1870 when you get the agricultural depression coming oh hello andrew hello how are you you okay um when you get the agricultural depression coming through they see it as a way to you know shore up their business diversify their investments the railway railways become an opportunity so aristocrats tend to go on the or become on greater numbers on the board of railway companies and ex-railway officers. Now, these are actually quite um, quite small in number. There are some who become quite famous, like uh, Edward Watkin, who becomes a sort of managing director. And we'll talk a bit more about him later. Um, and Charles Scotter of the London South Western Railway, George Gibb of the NER, but that really only seems to come through a bit later when the, the managerial positions come and they develop into these, should we say, very important positions. And we'll talk about why that's so a bit later. So how, how many directors did a railway company have? Well, it varied and it varied dependent on the nature of the company and also the founding acts of parliament. You know, these things were laid down. Uh, oh, hello, David. How are you? You're all right um so as you can see there i've got main the main companies in britain in 1884 we've got everything from the london brighton south coast and the london chatham and dover having a measly eight directors right up to the london northwestern railway having 30 and that's i think largely because it, it absorbs numerous major companies now where's the midland midland had 15 but it was you know the largest company in britain in kept by capital value around 1900 or towards this period so it's not really it is sometimes linked to the size but it's it's also um linked to other factors um so i, I really don't have a defining sort of why this why this sort of number comes about why a number comes about um but I think one of the, the critical features that we find is that over the period, over the 19th century, the number of the um, the number of invest the amount of investment, uh, sorry, the, the role of the director sort of changed. Now, the Liverpool Manchester is really interesting because they try and control the railway directly themselves. Initially, they try to 
get involved in everything right down to a bale of cotton falling off a train. They met five times, as I say, there in January 1831. But soon they realised that they cannot, that the board of directors, which might meet every every two weeks, um, or in five times in January in 1831, but soon that becomes impractical. Most boards would meet every two weeks. So they form a management committee, and that is supposed to organise things day to day. But the board of directors change, and, and, and what happens is they, they increasingly have a sort of salaried uh, staff. And, I mean, Chandler has talked about this in the case of the United States. The increasing scale and scope of the industry leads to the development of a management class. You get chief executives or executives coming through. Initially, it's usually a lot of the sort of day to day is might be to a, running to a secretary. So that's not a secretary in the in the way we, we kind of think about it now. But it, it's a it's a, an official that you know would look after the day to day running of the company, um, secretary to the board perhaps, and sort of towards the eighteen. 1840s, 50s, and 60s, you get general managers' positions coming in. So the board actually delegates more and more control and power as the companies grow to these salaried officials. And what this means is that the board's role steps away from the day to day management. So that's the boardroom at Paddington. I like that because you can actually see on the back of the of the wall the map. And that's really interesting because, you know, they would I, – I always wonder if they would get up and take a look at at the map to see what sort of strategy they're going to work out. The other thing to know I, I like about this picture is that you have the seats along the back. Now, people might come to make representations to the board, whether they are uh, a senior officer. So the board meetings would generally – be attended by the the chief opera, you know the chief official whether that's a general manager or traffic manager sometimes is called early on but you might get sort of people come and say well we, we want an extra train service we want uh, you to build a line so that's where they probably would sit before they're invited to come and talk they might be invited in i suppose but anyway so that's about sort of 1914. so the role of the board is is like the chief authorizing um body in the railway company now it wouldn't it wouldn't do everything i mean some companies in some companies they did try to do everything but as the company grows you you need to sort of uh you know you get specialization yeah sort of specialization you know you get uh, a diversification of the you know the officers become more diverse you get chief audit officer you get chief you know locomotive superintendent chief engineer and that you know those things those things are quite well defined but they they develop all sort of bodies of individuals underneath them but what happens is you get different committees set up by boards as the business grows so there are some of the examples and these committees might be three to six of the board members and they might meet on the day of the board meeting um uh they they might meet before the board meeting or the day before david great question were some directors involved in multiple railway companies yes they were and i'm going to get onto that in a bit so stay tuned so you got these sort of different committees and they would deal with different things and usually at the committee the chief officer for that particular department would attend to inform the discussions now in theory, in theory, the general manager, if by the 1860s and 1870s, would be overseeing those chief officers. They would also have a sort of day-to-day -day oversight of them. But in practice, what the meeting of, say, a say the locomotive superintendent rocks up at the committee and talks directly to the directors and the general manager is not there, he can influence the board to make the decision to sign off on a decision that they come to themselves you know without you know outside of the general manager and a great example of this is when adams in the london southwestern railway comes into the company in 1878 he starts to take authority away from the general manager because he meets the locomotive committee and goes this guy over here he doesn't know what he's doing 
the general manager, Scott, had been there for nearly 30 years. He had limited experience beyond the company. So that's the in theory sort of structure. Every committee would make decisions. The directors would decide on something. It would go up to the board and then they'd sign off on it. In practice, it was a bit more different. It was a bit, it was a bit different. So traffic committee was the most important committee. So the general manager would go to the, the, the traffic committee. And actually what that does is it allows um, that committee to control much of the policy uh, because they're getting all the main headline decisions. So the locomotive committee might actually have a proposal that is sent down from the traffic committee. So the traffic committee needs to manage the traffic. So it would go, oh, well, we need X many locomotives. We need X many uh, amount of rolling stock. And there would be like a separate, you know, uh, there might be a separate rolling stock committee. Um, these aren't all the committees that are uh, in the in the mix, but they might, the traffic committee might divulge something to the locomotive committee who would make a decision and might send it up back to the traffic committee or up to the board. Same with way it works. The traffic committee says, oh, well, we need a new warehouse at Station X. They would send that down to the Way and Works Committee to get an estimate, to find a contractor. So the traffic committee comes actually a very sort of central committee to the functioning of the railway. Major decision, major investment decision. So traffic committee might decide we're going to put a warehouse up or a goods shed. The board would just sort of sign off on that. But like major investments would, of course, be run through the board. Um, and that, that board level conversations. The board also would deal with sort of major issues, should we say, uh, issuing more stock. They would deal with issuing, uh, you know, issuing orders. Sort of, they would authorize the rule book, for example, for all staff. So they would cover all these major events, all these sort of pan company of uh, issues. So that's that's the sort of how it worked. But of course. It's not so cut and dry. If you've got three or four people on the traffic committee, they are going to be probably some of the most active directors in the company. So the reason I've got the middle and main line there, uh, well, that's St Pancras, beautiful in its glory and its wonder. Um, and on the right, you've got James Allport, who was the general manager. And I know we're not talking about general managers, but it's, it's kind of important to think about the relationship between the general manager and uh, the directors. The general manager was the chief executive, and we'll talk about sort of their power generally in this period a bit later. But one of the things about the middle and main line is that the decision to build, I mean, this is the, the work of Jeff Channon, who, who did a lot of work on the management and organization of British railway companies. Uh, one of the things that develops uh, is, is a relationship between the general manager and uh, a clique of directors who drive the decisions forward. So he called them, those directors, uh, you know, activists. And so Allport works with those two or three directors. And directors have as much role as Allport in making that decision. But you get this small sort of set of activist directors who really push the main line. They push it through. So it's not, it's not as cut and dry as saying a directorship that had 15 people Every one of them would be active. In fact, I reckon that the board sent the least active directors off to, say, the audit committee. And at times, uh, of course, sometimes if you've got a financial expert, a banker, you want them on the audit committee. You utilise, you you gain those skills and you put them where they're, they're most useful. But one of the things is we've got this sort of what we'll call back, backwardsmen and activists. Now, when I was doing my uh phd i did similar sort of thing for the lsw the london southwestern railway and i went a bit further and this is a sort of sample of some of the stuff i did and i looked at so how long were people on the board i tried to identify which would be the plausibly most active directors so it's a bit of a it's a it's a lot it's a lot of data but i identified four categories of director higher activists major activists, lesser activists, and backwardsmen. And what you can see there is, is the top of the list. 
And I worked it out by actually sort of saying, how long were they on the board? Were they on the traffic committee? So the most important. Did they meet? Did they go to any of the sort of joint committees? So the joint, you know, a joint committee with the London and Northwestern Railway uh, between the London Northwestern and Midland Railways. That that is a di- diplomatic function that the the director also performs. So that would show how plugged in they were into policy. Also, were they chairman, deputy chairman, and did they attend the special committees? So some companies formed special committees to deal with special issues. Uh, in the London South Western Rail- Railways case, it was a case of fraud in 1850. Two on the part of the traffic manager, um, Cornelius Stobin, who then absconded to Canada and they formed a, a special committee. So were they involved with those? And I managed to work out who were the most important directors in the company's history. And it, it kind of turns out you can look at when these directors were most active um, in the company and, and correlate that. So when the, these directors are most active in the business of the company is also when the power of the general manager is less. So you get that development of uh, a relationship between board activism and uh, power of the director, oh, sorry, general manager. But it's a, it's a complex thing, but it, it just shows that, you know, not every director was as active and as engaged as everybody else. But you also get the development of some managing directors or chief executives. So I've got three there. And the one in the middle is Edward Watkin. Everybody knows about Edward Watkin. Watkin was chairman of various companies. He was, uh, uh, you know, he, he was on the board of, I think, about 10 companies. And he drove through some major projects, the Great Central Main Line. He uh, brought the Southeastern Railway back to solvency and he was involved in the Met- Metropolitan. But he also um, was what we call, you know, he was a, a, to a degree a managing director. But I think what's also forgotten is sometimes, and, and Terry Gervish says this in his paper on it, he relied a lot on his general managers. So I, I, I think his life must have been a round of meetings. But he was um, he was very, you know, he, he was active in multiple boards. But actual true, uh, I think, managing directors, we have to look to the people either side. Richard Moon. Richard Moon was someone who kicked out uh, Mark Hewish as general manager, one of the first sort of people we point to as one of the first general managers, proper general managers in uh, the, the railway industry or for the standards of the day, one of these sort of major chief executives. Um, but managing directors, Richard Moon was a, a, a good managing director, you know, sorry, good, what do I mean? He was a managing director who very much was in control of all the elements of the railway. He was uh, the London Northwestern Railway's uh, managing director from about 1861 right through to 1891. 91, I think. And he very much was chairman of the board, but he wasn't under no obligation to get involved in the company in the way he did. But he, he would he would be over everything. He was he was also quite tight fisted and he was you know down to the line on every penny. He would pu- push back investment. Um, and it has been argued that actually his actions sort of was not enough investment, which meant the LNWR didn't really come out of his period in the particularly best health it could, but that's for debate. The other one I know a bit more about, Sir Charles Scotter, he was the London South Western's general manager. He actually trained under Watkin in the Great Central Railway. He was the general manager from 1885 right up to 1897. But he then went on to the board. He quickly became deputy chairman and then chairman. And he ruled the South Western quite strongly. Charles Owens, the general manager, didn't really get a look in. Um, but also that that sort of step up from uh, the general managership into the board level led to the company and, you know, a quite, should we say, conservative with a small, small C general manager, led to a quite conservative company strategy and policies uh, up until uh, 1912 when Herbert Walker came in. 
but he's all over it, you know, activities and uh, of the company. And what is really interesting for me has always been an interesting question. Well, when do you get that point where you get the general managers, the salaried paid executives coming to power in the industry? And I think, oh, we'll go back. So that was a bit, no. And I think actually it's easy to say that, oh, well, um, general managers in the railways up to the end, end of the sort of Edwardian period were were powerful. We, we've got George Gibbs, Scotter himself, when he was general manager, people like um, people like Finlay in the LNW for a time. And all these people were quite powerful individuals. But actually what we get is a mix. We get companies where the general manager is is dominant and then we get companies where the board and particularly a couple of individuals are dominant. The salaried executive in British Railways before 1914, I don't think necessarily has um, or complete delegated control or doesn't have a, a the sort of huge influence that maybe chief executives do today or, you know. So it's, and even then that's doubtful. But um it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, question about who controls company policy, and I don't think there's a, a straight answer. The other thing, and this goes back to say Leslie Hanna's work on separation of ownership, which is the shareholders and control, managers and directors. When did shareholders stop being able to influence the directorate and the management? So. I think they very quickly lose any sort of sense of direct regular control. The early railways are quickly too complex and big for you know, shareholders to really take a, a, a considerable influence. But actually, there are instances right up until the end of our period, or say 1900, where shareholders would kick out a board or a director or a chairman who didn't agree with them, that wasn't making enough uh, money for them. So, of course, the obvious one is Hudson. Hudson with all his dealings and all his, uh, his wheeler dealings or, you know, financial uh, impropriety, paying shares out, you know, paying dividends out of capital and accounting errors. The shareholders got rid of him that, you know, very quickly. Uh, well, not very quickly, but after a while, once they found out, there was committees of investigation. But I think it's actually more interesting to look at the later period where people have said, well, shareholders didn't really have any power over the directors. Now, there is a change from about 1870 where you get sort of corporate governance goes much more towards the directors becoming self-perpetuating. So prior to then, a new director would have to be elected by the shareholders. In the case of the Southwest and a few other companies, they actually change the rules so that the directors can, the board can appoint their own, uh, their own, their own people that you know they can appoint who they want. And what that does is that kind of perpetuates a sort of oh we we're we're choosing people from amongst ourselves. And I've always wondered whether that that is partly the reason that sort of. Arguably, I'm going to say it, but innovation perhaps declines a tad, uh, maybe in, declines quite a bit in the late 19th and early 20th century railway companies. But the one I want to uh, focus on it is this chap in the middle, Marcus, Marquis of Tweedell. I hope I pronounced that right. He was a director of the North British Railway Company. Um, him and a few other directors were charged with the uh, uh, by the shareholders for actually not paying too much attention to the company. They actually kicked out the directorship, uh, the shareholders, in the 1890s because the directors would have one meeting every two, you know, every month. They wouldn't keep a close eye on the business. And the, the there were sort of accusations that they weren't sort of overseeing the general manager very well. But one of the key things, we'll come back to this in a minute, is that the director had a lot of external interest. Pedro had, I think, 12 other businesses he was a director of. So how could he keep track? The other one is the Taft Vale Company. Now, that's a uh, an advert from the time of the 
famous Taff Vale strike, which after the railway company uh, sued the union for damages and won, which uh, had implications for labour relations across industry, just not just in the railways. But one of the things that initiated that is that the directors got rid of the board. So there was a directorship and a general manager that actually had quite a good relationship with the unions. But as profitability fell, as more lines opened up in South Wales and the Taff Vale's profitability fell, they got unhappy and they kicked out the board, brought in a new general manager that was much tougher and he, uh, it's not is for another time, but it led to the Taff Vale strike because of the firing of a signalman. I think I've got that right. I might have to revise that one. But I think the point there is that it's an instance. We've got two instances in the 1890s of shareholders still being able to leverage power to change the strate strategic um, direction, the, the board of a railway company. So it's, a, it's an interesting change. It's an interesting switch, especially in an era when people say, I think there have been arguments advanced that actually major companies turning to joint stock, so away from, shall we say, family-owned towards uh, share, shareholders, uh, having large number of shareholders and limited liability. Um, they they were moving towards uh, more companies uh, have, having shareholders and having a base. There's a good case to argue that actually shareholders still have power in this period, and that needs to be explored a bit more in a bit more detail. So we were asked about whether railway company directors had uh, Dave, Dave's sort of question about whether they had positions on the board of other railway companies. Well, they did. This is a piece of research I've been doing, and this is the situation in 1897. This is the linkages between different railway companies by directors. So if we look, the thicker lines are where there are more directors in common. So to take an example, the South East and the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire have a big thicker line between them. And so they had, like, I think, three or four directors on the same board and they attached to the Metropolitan. Of course, that's the Watkin, we call it the Watkin Triangle, where they're Watkins companies. Um, some more interesting ones, I, you know, there's a director who sat on the Hull and Barnsley's board and the Metropolitan District's board. There isn't, there isn't a lot of, should we say, direct linkages um, beyond the Watkin Triangle. So, you know, companies that had end-to-end -end services that might, you know, need a sort of director to, to facilitate communication between the two companies. The only one I can really see, I mean, you might see more, but the only one I can see is the Midland and Glasgow and Southwestern, who, you know, one of the routes to Scotland um, from London and from London to Scotland. Uh, that That is the only you know, link, you know, that's an end-to-end -end linkage. The North London and the North London Northwestern Railway, of course, uh, the North London became part of the London Northwestern Railway eventually, but that, that, that was a unity that was already in place long before. So through the directorships, we can actually see control and ownership long before actual ownership took place. And the same applies with smaller companies. The railway companies tended to lease and work an awful lot of uh, different companies. Um, they, would, they wouldn't actually uh, be running their own services. The company would be leased. Say, good example, um, the uh, Salisbury and Yeovil Railway, which was part of the London South Western Railway main line, didn't run a single train or employ a single member of staff. The South Western owned it. They had a couple of directors in common, I think, at some point. But those directors are a way for the major company to exert power and influence over the smaller company to shape policy. And that's the case with the North London and London Northwestern. Actually, come to think of it, the Highland and the London Northwestern Railway would run, you know, you'd run three services. So that's the case as well. But also the Great Northern had a director on the Highland Railway, which, of course, the Highland, uh, the Great Northern was part of the East Coast collaboration. 
So I, 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 we don't know exactly how and why these different linkages might work, what, what influence they, uh, you know, they had where they weren't sort of end to end. So we know about the London Northwest and the North London Railways linkage, but why, why are the Hull and Barnsley having a director on the mid- Metropolitan? Is there anything there or is it just this guy was there? So we don't really know. So there's more to unpack here. Um, but I think for me, one of the, the most interesting sort of linkages is how railway companies are linked to other companies in the economy through their directors. What we've got here is another piece of research I've got um, about looking at the directors of the major railway companies in Britain. So the major 16 railway companies in Britain. And as we can see, the number of directorships in the industry in the major companies is quite large. So you've got 293, it goes up to 314. That's because of the opening thing of, of companies like the Hull and Barnsley. And it is roughly the same in 1914. As you can see, the number of external directorships jumps dramatically. That's in part because companies were opening up to joint stock ownership and, and you know, needing more directors perhaps. But also, you know, the opportunities in the corporate economy grow for sitting on directorships. But also, I think it's a strategic choice in many cases. <coughs> Excuse me. A strategic choice, and we'll get to those in a moment, about sort of we're going to put try and put a direct, we're going to try and recruit a director on the board uh, from who who sits on a banking company um, that might help us with raising capital. The interesting thing below is actually how many external directorships individuals had. I won't go into depth because it's a lot of detail, but you've got by 1897, there is one railway director with 20, over 20 individual positions outside the industry. But most railway directors were holding positions outside the industry, like two or three. They weren't holding too many. Um, maybe four to six is the well one is the biggest group after the two to three so what we can say is that actually the railway industry is quite highly networked through its directors into the corporate economy into uh, you know a range of direct uh, companies and many of its customers i would imagine many of its financiers also and we'll, we'll get to that in a second so i think it's important that we don't think about the railway industry as self-contained we think about it as part of this broader network so where did, where were these directorships being held so if we look one of the biggest groupings is commerce banking and finance and i think that's partly because you want to have a director on the board of a company which is financing you and these linkages actually reduce uncertainty for both both parties if you've got a director if you're a bank and you've got a director on the board of a railway company who you've given a loan to these are companies with high debt to equity ratios if you've given a loan um, to uh, a, a railway company then you want to know that money's secure so it works for both the bank and the railway company the other thing is a lot of investment houses towards the end of this period you get the rise of the should we say institutional investors so insurance funds and stuff like that and of course the railway companies want to perhaps encourage more investments so maybe they see a value in that of putting a director on an investment company board or vice versa the railway company the investment trust wants to know that its uh, shareholding is it, it is safe and secure as we as we can see, there's not much in say manufacturing in industry, in industry, food, drink, and tobacco. It's not the biggest bulk of things. And I think actually the only, as I said, the exception is the Northeastern Railway. And R. J. Irving said of the Northeastern's board that they use it as like a holding company for the region's industry, it's getting favourable deals on rates and facilities. And actually, the primary interest of most of the directors of the directors on the Northeastern board was not actually um actually you know share you know uh the railway company so 
Other transport, that one's a bit of an uh, an obvious one. You know, it's if you've got links with the shipping company, you can have good communication between those two companies. Same for the shipping company in the opposite direction. You can arrange through tickets, through routes. The other group is overseas and freestanding companies. Now, here's an interesting sort of triangle. On the border of the Northeastern Railway, so a freestanding company is um, an idea that came from, and I might get this right, Moira Wilkins. Myra Wilkins. I might go out wrong. Never mind. Wilkins. Um, about British companies that really had a had a headquarters in London, but their operations were completely overseas. A unique it was proposed a unique form of corporate governance. Um, this has been kind of called in, you know, it, it's still being thought about and worked on as an idea. But these companies were quite big as places to invest your money in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, economy. And they take a fair proportion of the number of interlocking directions. And the concept one is very interesting. So the Northeastern Railway had a director who was also a director of the Concert Iron Company. And this director also had a position on the board of the Concert's Iron Ore Mining Company in north north of Spain, which was a base of operations. So you, there you see a triangle where, or a triangle or a sort of linkage, where actually those linkages might help the railway company understand, you know, what's going on in Concert, what's going on in the overseas mining company. So it's not simply about investment and, you know, having other positions just to protect your own income. Uh, for, for some directors, it, it, it provides links and information and reduces uncertainty in times of financial struggle or, you know, allows you to make strategy and policy with better information coming from that network of directors. Railways. Now, that one is a bit misleading because these are all those small companies I was talking about. So there's a lot of positions in smaller railway companies, uh, you know, these lines that were leased and work. But as you can see, it actually shrinks both in absolute terms and in, well, overall and in proportionate terms. And that's because the railway companies, the major railway companies actually are buying up uh, from the 1870s more of these small companies they lease and work. Again, that's an effort to secure the company's sort of roots. And uh, they, some of the deals they have with, were made in the 1860s. And they weren't very good by the 1880s and 1890s, so a quicker way is to invest a lot of money in buying them up, some money in buying them up. So that that is a, a good overview of how networked the railway industry's directors were in this period. They were they were connected to all sorts of businesses, and that's not actually included the sort of links to um, partnerships. A lot of directors had partnerships in companies which were not you know, in, in the listed companies. They weren't on the stock exchange. So you get these uh, interesting uh, interlinks that are not on here. So I think maybe it's time to start rethinking railway company boards to rather than thinking of them as, you know, dedicated to the railway, actually thinking, well, what are the multiple purposes of these linkages? And they are networked people. So the the good example of this is Viscount Perry, who was uh, so the, the core of this story is the Titanic. So Viscount Perry was on the board of the London South Western Railway from about 1910 to 11. Um, that's Southampton Docks. There is the image, and he comes on the board and gets put on the docks committee. Suddenly, the London South Western Railway is getting the White Star Line dock at Southampton. And the reason is, I think, and we, I don't know exactly why he was brought on and if he was brought on previous to that decision to facilitate it or it came after, but he bears his influence, he puts his influence to bear on the Southwestern. So three other linkages. He is the chairman of Harland and Wolf, who are building the Titanic and the Olympic and the third ship, who I can't remember. And he's also on the board of the White Star Line. So he is a network within himself. He's also interlinked to 
you know, he's on the board of other shipping companies. And in fact, if we go back, ah, are we going the wrong way? If we go back, the shipping here, 18, uh, 18, uh, sorry, 1914, 67, about 20 of those are two London South Western Railway directors anyway. But what that does is it does certain things for the company. It guarantees the London South Western Railway the trade from the White Star Line. It creates a good information flow between the companies and it reduces uncertainty for the companies. And I think that's that's key, especially um, at this time when the London South Western Railway are trying to expand the Southampton Docks. They want to guarantee there's traffic and trade. So he he is useful both for the railway company and his position on the railway company is useful for his other companies. The other tap I want to talk about here is David Alfred Thomas. He's one of the sort of super directors. He has oodles of positions and, and there is his list. This is in 1914. He's a he's a coal magnate in, the, in, in Wales and he creates these networks and again it's a case of reducing uncertainty it's about uh, leveraging your influence social capital i think is really important here he can leverage the links to actually build his own status i suppose when you've got lots of links to all these companies you know a lot about coal you know who to talk to you're someone who could get things done people might come to you it builds your own status and influence within the network and he uses this to become, you know, these networks to become one of the major coal uh, link person linked to the coal industry uh, at this time. He also tries to become, you know, uh, I think he tries to become or, or actually becomes an MP. So he's a very busy person, but th th this shows the sort of how embedded these people were, these, some of these directors were in the. Um, in the sort of networks that they, you know, the, the, the sort of corporate economy at the time. I will say one of our sort of gaps in our knowledge is actually understanding how this shaped railway company policy and vice versa. Now, you can see he's got the Port Tal Talbot Docks and Railway Company on there and his railway one, uh, I think actually his railway, his other, his main railway one, which I think was the Taff Vale, was is not on there. I can't see them, you know. But I think I think it's important that we need more investigation of how these linkages influence railway company policy, and to what extent that might have influenced the profitability and performance of those companies, but also, you know, things like labour relations. One of the interesting ones. Uh, directorships is uh, Michael Thomas Bass, who set up, oh no, so it was his son, but a Bass was on the board of the Midland Railway, of course, Bass the brewery was the world's largest railway customer in the late 19th century, but this family of, had really sort of, you know, they treated their workers at the brewery well. Michael Thomas Bass actually set up or helped set up the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants because he was MP for Derby, he was embedded in the community and the life of the town. His son goes onto the board of the Midland Railway, and and that linkage between those two companies must have worked out in in both the brewery and the railway's favour. Again, it's something I need to look at, or somebody need to look at. Ah, concert. I was going to talk about concert, but yeah, there is a a strong link between the different companies. So that's my slideshow. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've missed out a lot. I'm sorry. This is all the, should we say, thinking through things and, you know, stuttering a little. That's, that's me learning how to do this. But that's my show for the evening. If you've got any questions, please do ask. I mean, I've got a bank of a brain in there and I, I know some things, but If there's anything that anybody would like to ask quickly, I, if not, I will. I will do. I will do the end credits, shall we say? So, what have we got coming up in future future weeks? So next week, we've got my good friend Gareth Dennis. He's going to be on. Um, 
He hasn't really got a title. We haven't got a title. So just sort of Gareth Dennis being awesome on there. He's going to be on next Monday. And we're going to talk about history and institutional memory, perhaps, and, and, and you know how, how history might play into some things in the modern industry and how important it is and how people use it. Um, we're not really sure what our topic will be, but we'll, we'll try chat about that. And then the week after, we've got, again, my friend, um, Mike Espester, who's doing the Railway Work Life and Death Project, and he's um, he's going to talk about railway safety and his project, which logs the safety, you know, the accidents of railway workers. So we do actually have a, a, a question. Uh, we've got Michael. Were many family links between directors? Yes, actually, there were. There were sometimes uh, links between. So the, the Southwestern was actually a good example. They hired as a director the son of a long-standing director when he died simply to keep up the family ties part of that is to do with the fact that some companies usually had sort of regional representation so for example the southwestern was keen to get a, a representative from different places they they served of course that that is useful again it goes back to the sort of idea of you know securing um securing uh a you know knowledge of the, the 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 communities and places they served and you know giving more information to the central company so it, yeah you do get that but i i think actually by the end of the period it's it's, it's kind of less common um any chance you providing your references of the broadcast well um i can see what well i won't turn around and and, and look at them but i, I think and get them out i think yeah i'll pop i'll pop some things in the comments uh, a few uh comments uh on what what i've been using to do this um, i mean of course a lot of the research is my own but i've been using the work of rj irving of michael bonavia and uh jeff channon principally um and they're all available to buy uh so if you like this oh how big is the railway studies unit uh if how big is the railway studies unit at the university um sorry i'll answer some more questions it's just me there is no department there used to be but it's just me at the moment um and there are some transport historians around the uh university but we don't we don't really have a department anymore um i just teach the program and uh, do research on my own and i work with some excellent wonderful colleagues at the management school get the impression that the central manager that this central area of management that has so many consequences for it is distinctly under research yes it is jeff channon did a lot of work on the great western railway we know a lot about the great western railways directors we know stump stuff on the northeastern railway directors but actually like the stuff i've shown you from my own research it is 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 brand new we we need much more um much more work on the directors i think because it, well, it fascinates me i've got numerous research projects but understanding how not simply who the directors were but how did they leverage these linkages and how did they spread their tentacles into other industries and the corporate economy is something I really want to look into at some point. So I'm going to perhaps call it a day there. So a few announcements. If you like what I do, I have a Kofi coffee page so you can, uh, if you like what I do, buy me a coffee. Um, we are still recruiting for the MA in Railway Studies um, and the MA is now nearly, we're nearly getting to full, full capacity, but the MA is a three-year online course, and we do stuff like this. We do, you know, social history, economic history, business history, and cultural history. So a whole gamut of stuff right through from 1825 to 2010. So thank you so much for joining. Are we we not the most, not as perhaps... Uh, busy as last week 
But thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope to get better as time goes on. And uh, yes, well, see you next week. <laughs>